Maranatha, and happy Sabbath morning to everyone. Welcome to the Granite Bay Hilltop Church, Seventh-day Adventist Hilltop Church. We are pleased, we are so joyous, we're full of joy to have all of you here today, not only those that are here in person, but also those that are watching online, watching on AFAX TV, some TV, and wherever else this message is being broadcast. So we want to welcome you to uh, the beginning of day two of our weekend seminar, Amazing Sanctuary, a Most Holy Place. How many of you enjoyed last night? Amen. Well, today we're going to have another a roller coaster fun day, so I hope you're all ready for it. And so uh, before we get started, we are going to sing our theme song on the sanctuary. Just want to remind you also that the sermons this morning are being translated into Spanish if you know somebody. So let's get ready. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. A missionary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living missionary for you. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Are you excited? Amen. Amen. I can't wait. You know, we did an overview of the sanctuary last night. Today, we're going to land the plane and go a little bit slower and a little bit deeper. How many of you say amen to that? So I'm delighted to have uh, Brother Pastor Stephen Bohr, president of Secrets Unsealed and Some TV. He is going to share with us now God's final message of love. So let's have a word of prayer together, and then Pastor Bohr will come out and share with us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful, Father, for this day that you have given us, this wonderful day to study your word all day. It's going to be a wonderful day, Father. And I just pray right now that you give Pastor Bohr the words to say, and that you would anoint all of our hearts that we may hear these words and apply them to our lives, that we may know your way. We love you and we thank you, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Let us all say amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Along with James Rafferty, I want to say that it's a real blessing to have real people out there. You know, for the last year and two months, I've only been in um, four life places. One is Fresno Central Church, my local church. I preach there to less than 25% attendance. Then, uh, about three weeks ago, I preached at the Bakersfield Hillcrest Church, and last Sabbath at the Mountain View Hispanic Church, and now here. But I have not traveled out of California for a year and two months, and I'm getting kind of edgy. (laughs) Because I had to postpone or cancel a lot of the commitments for the last year, so it's going to be difficult to make them all up. Well, we've had our prayer, and the title of our study this morning is... God's final message of love. And I want to begin by reading that message. It actually is composed of three parts. Let's go to Revelation chapter 14 and verses 6 through 12. Revelation 14, 6 through 12. I know that we probably have this passage memorized, but let's read it anyway because this is what we're going to study uh, this morning. It says in Revelation 14, verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, 
having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. God's final message of love. Now, when we study a passage of Scripture, we need to ask the passage questions. And then, in the context of the totality of Scripture, we look for the answers to the questions. So I have a series of questions regarding what we just read. Several of them. What is the everlasting gospel? What do the three angels represent? Why are they described as flying in the midst of heaven? Why are the messages proclaimed to the whole world? What does it mean to fear God? What does it mean to give glory to God? What and when is the hour of God's judgment? What does it mean to worship the Creator? What is Babylon? Why did Babylon fall? What is Babylon's wine of wrath? What does a prophecy mean when it says that Babylon fornicates with the kings of the earth? Who is the beast? Who is the image of the beast? What is the mark of the beast? What is the number of the beast? What is the wine of God's wrath? Why is it poured out without mixture? Will the worshipers of the beast be incinerated in fire that will never go out? What is the patience of the saints? What are the commandments of God? What is meant by the faith of Jesus? And who are the 144,000 and when will they live? I would say our work is cut out for us. <laughs> you know, several years ago, I did a series on the three angels' messages. Yet 24, 25 actually, presentations of one hour each studying each phrase of the three angels' message. There's a lot more there than meets the eye. So what I want to do is share with you, being that I'm here at this beautiful place, 12 amazing facts about the three angels' message. First, the angels that are mentioned in the three angels' message are not the ones who proclaim the messages. We are not to expect three literal angels flying and whizzing by in heaven, shouting out the messages that we just read. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 to 3 tells us that there is a chain that God uses to share his message with this earth. Let's read Revelation 1, verses 1 to 3. Now, this applies specifically to John, a prophet, but it applies basically, in principle, to everyone. It says in Revelation 1, 1 through 3, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy of this book and keep those things which are written in it, 
for the time is at hand. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Now let me mention the chain of command. The message originates with God the Father. God the Father gives it to Jesus. Jesus, it's not mentioned in these verses, but Jesus gives it to the Holy Spirit. Because we're told, here that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So the Father gives it to Jesus, Jesus gives it to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit gives it to the angel, the angel gives it to John, John sends it to the churches, and the churches are to proclaim the message to the world. That's God's chain of command in imparting the message. Now, in the New Testament, human beings are called angels. For example, John the Baptist is called God's messenger. The word is angelos, God's angel. We find that the messengers that John sent, sent to ask Jesus whether he was the Messiah, they are described in Luke 7:24 as angels, messengers. We find that the spies, the two spies that went to Jericho, are called angels or messengers. In Galatians chapter 4 and verse 14, the apostle Paul is called an angel of God. Stephen, we're told in Acts 6 verse 15, had the face of an angel when he was bearing witness. And we're told in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20 that the seven stars are the seven angels to the seven churches, and Ellen White identifies them as the ministers or preachers of the churches. So when we're told here that the everlasting gospel is preached by angel, by an angel, we are to understand that it is the angel in cooperation with human beings. God has not given the proclamation of the gospel to angels. Notice Matthew chapter 28 and verses 18 through 20. Very well known, it's the Great Commission, and Jesus came and spoke to them, to his disciples, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So Jesus told his disciples, Go, he spoke to them. The preaching of the gospel is given to us, of course, aided by the angels. Notice Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Acts 1 verse 8. But you shall receive power. Here Jesus is speaking to his disciples. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So these three angels actually represent God helping his people proclaim these messages. It's interesting to notice that in the book of Acts, the angels actually help in the proclamation of the gospel through human beings. For example, in Acts cha chapter 8 and verse 26, we find an angel instructing Philip to go and speak to the Ethiopian eunuch and gives him the words to speak to him. We also find in Acts chapter 10 and verse 3 that an angel speaks to Cornelius and says, Hey Cornelius, there, Peter has a message for you. And so now Cornelius goes to Peter. So here we see that angels direct God's people and help God's people. In fact, Ellen White says that there are angels standing by when we are giving Bible studies to enlighten our mind, to give us words to speak. So the first amazing fact is that the angels represent the work of God's people on earth in proclaiming these messages. Now let's go to amazing fact number two. The angels fly in the midst of heaven, which means that the messages are of heavenly origin. It's interesting to notice that God's uh, location where he lives is in heaven, and heaven is north. Heaven is up. You know, in the Bible, north is up. 
God, therefore, when he sends his message, it comes from heaven. However, the Bible tells us that Satan is the king of the abyss, also called the bottomless pit. You can find that in Revelation chapter 9 and verse 11. Satan is the prince of darkness. Now, let me just mention this interesting detail. If you look in the Bible, God's points of the compass are north and east. Satan's points of the compass are west and south. And you say, why is that? It has to do with the location of the sun. Satan is the prince of darkness. Light originates in the east, and it reaches its highest intensity above our heads in the north. The sun sets in the west and reaches its deepest darkness directly below in the south. That's the reason why when Jesus came to this world, he came from the east. Notice Luke chapter, uh, chapter 1 and verses 78 and 79. It speaks about the coming of Jesus, his incarnation. It says, through the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring, it's two words in Greek, anatole heliu, which means the rising sun. So it says, with, uh, with which the rising sun from on high has visited us to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. And that's the reason why Jesus, when he returns the second time, will come from the east, according to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 27. And by the way, the angel with the seal of God comes from the east. And the loud cry angel of Revelation chapter 18 comes from heaven. He comes from the north. And Daniel chapter 11, 44 tells us that the loud cry and the sealing message will trouble the king of the north, the final, final antichrist. And so, the three angels fly in the midst of heaven. It means that the message is of heavenly origin. By the way, the book of James, chapter 3 and verses 15 through 17, I'm only going to read a portion. It contrasts the wisdom from above with the wisdom from below. It says there, this wisdom does not descend from above, Satan's wisdom that is, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. So whatever doesn't come from above comes from below, from Abaddon, the destroyer, the king of the abyss. By the way, this is the reason why in Revelation 18 verse 1, God's message comes from the north, the final loud cry message. We're told there, after these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. So notice, he comes from the north, but he arrives by way of the east, because the earth is enlightened with his glory. Now let's go to amazing fact number three. The loud voice of the first angel and the two following angels represents the power and the authority of the message that is given. In fact, when we're told that the message is given with a loud voice, the Greek words is phone megale, where we get the word megaphone from. Now, have you ever, ever heard a megaphone? It's shrill. It can be heard. In other words, this message is proclaimed with unmitigated power. There is no word parsing. There is no political correctness. This is not some ambivalent doublespeak. There is no muting of the trumpet. It is shouted from the rooftops, so to speak, no matter what the consequences might be. The fourth amazing fact is that these angels fly with the utmost velocity. They're not, uh, they're not uh, uh, you know, hydroplaning through heaven. This is not talking about, about um, you know, a slow movement. They move with velocity. In fact, go with me to Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, where we find a description of how the angels move. It says there, as for the likeness of the living creatures, which are angels, 
Their appearance was like the burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches going back and forth among the living creatures. The fire was bright, and out of the fire went lightning. And the living creatures, listen carefully, ran back and forth in appearance like a flash of lightning. How fast do angels move? Like lightning. How fast does lightning move? Well, you know, I'm sure you've seen lightning. So how does God want these messages to be proclaimed? We need to get down to business. They need to be proclaimed quickly, particularly as we see the things that are happening in the world today. Incidentally, in Daniel 9, we have a very interesting story. How far do you think uh, the third heaven is from where we're at now? I would say it's a long ways, deep down in Orion somewhere. But Daniel 9 tells us that Daniel raised a prayer to the Lord. And before he ended his prayer, Gabriel came and he said, you know, when you started your prayer, I was already on the way. And he was there. Now this is a speed that we can't understand, the speed of angels. But God is telling us that we need to get down to business and we need to share the message with the utmost speed. Amazing fact number five. The messages are global. They must circle the entire world. They are to go to every people, every language group, every person on planet Earth. Let's read Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. Many of these verses we're very well acquainted with. Jesus said, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. The gospel of Mark adds in chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, And he said to them, this is Jesus, He said to them, Go into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Now here's a very important point. In order for the message to, to go globally, there must be a global church to proclaim it. God has chosen the Seventh-day Adventist Church for one specific purpose, and that is to plant believers in every country of the world, to proclaim the three angels' message. That is the reason for our existence. If we're not doing that, we have no reason to exist. Notice this remarkable statement by Ellen White, Nine Testimonies, page 19. In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen. What is a watchman? That's a defensive task, isn't it? It's to defend, to make sure the thief doesn't come in. So she says, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen, but we're not only to play defense and defend the truth, she also continues, and light bearers. That's offense. So we're to play defense, defend the message, and also be light bearers. She continues, to them, to Seventh-day Adventists, has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the Word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import. In other words, the most solemn importance. The proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's messages. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. That's the reason we exist. Let me ask you, do you know of any other church in the world who, say, who says, our mission is to proclaim the three angels' message to the world? Any other church you know of? There is no other church. God has chosen the Seventh-day Adventist Church to plant believers in the entire world so that when crunch time comes, everyone on earth will have the opportunity of knowing God's last message of love. 
Amazing facts number six. These messages must be proclaimed in order. We're told that an angel flies in the midst of heaven, then it says another angel, and it says, and another angel followed them. Don't try and convince people about the mark of the beast before you preach the everlasting gospel. <laughs> you see, the first angel's message has the everlasting gospel. That's the first thing we need to proclaim. Jesus lived for us, died for us. If you repent, confess your sins, and have faith in Jesus, you can have the assurance of forgiveness. But then the first angel's message has three imperatives, three commands. So the everlasting gospel tells us what Jesus did for us. Now, Jesus says, now I'm going to tell you, you have something to do in response. What are the three imperatives? Fear God. By the way, in Greek, it's an imperative. Give glory to Him. Worship Him. That's our response to the gospel. Now, the second angel's message tells us that Babylon has fallen. Why has Babylon fallen? Babylon has fallen because it rejected the first angel's message. So there's a sequence in the three angels' message. Let me ask you, does Babylon fear God? No. Does Babylon give glory to God? No. Does Babylon worship the Creator on His holy day? No. And so if Babylon rejects the first message, is it going to accept the second message, come out of Babylon? No. So the second message says, Babylon fell because it rejected the first angel's message, and then Revelation 18 adds, come out of her. And then a third angel follows. And the third angel says, listen, if you don't come out, you're going to end up worshiping the beast and his image, and you're going to end up receiving the mark. Do you see the sequence? The first angel's message is a positive message. The everlasting gospel. Fear God, give glory to him. We're in the hour of his judgment. Worship the creator. The second message says Babylon fell because it did not accept the first angel's message. So if you're in Babylon, come out. The third angel says if you don't come out, you will suffer the wrath of God. And that doesn't sound very loving, does it? But God's warnings are warnings of love. The reason why he tells us not to worship the beast in his image is because he doesn't want us to be lost. He doesn't want us to stay in the system that is called the beast. He doesn't want us to worship the image, so he gives warnings. The warnings of God are messages of love. Amazing fact number seven. The messages are God's final message to the world. After this, there will be no more messages of God. And by the way, I'm including Revelation 18, which is, you know, Revelation chapter 18, um, maybe I shouldn't use this illustration because we don't believe in steroids, but Revelation 18 is the three angels' message on steroids. <laughs> Let me put it in a nicer way. The message of the fourth angel, Revelation 18, is um, the three angels' message with booster cables. That's nicer, isn't it? In other words, it intensifies and gives more power to the three angels' message. It is actually related to the three angels' message. It's not a separate message. And so the three angels' message with this message of the fourth angel is God's final message to the world. It will divide the entire world into two groups. You say, how do we know it's God's final message? Well, notice Revelation 14, verse 14. Revelation chapter 14, verse 14, comes immediately after the third angel's message. What happens immediately after the third angel's message? It says there in Revelation 14, verse 14, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Who is that man's Son of Man seated on a cloud? It's Jesus. And what event is being described? His coming. So you have the three messages and then the coming of Jesus. 
That's why Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14, which I read before, says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and what? And then the end will come. So you have the three angels' message proclaimed, and then you have Jesus sitting in the cloud coming to the earth to harvest the earth. Amazing fact number eight, the message of the three angels is empowered by the latter rain. You say, how do we know that? Well, let me ask you, what was it that ripened the harvest in biblical times? What ripened the harvest in biblical times was the latter rain, right? We're all agreed? So let me ask you, immediately after the third angel's message, Jesus is seated on a cloud, the Son of Man is seated on a cloud, is the harvest of the earth ripe? Yes. Are the grapes ripe? Yes, the harvest represents the righteous. The grapes represent the wicked. So have the three angels' messages ripened the saved for salvation and the lost for perdition. Absolutely. And so, this is God's final message to the world. Of course, intensified by the message of Revelation chapter 18. Amazing fact number eight. Well, that was number eight, right? So let's go to amazing fact number nine. This is a very important point. You have behind you, behind me, in front of you, the Ark of the Covenant, the most holy place. These messages come from the most holy place of the sanctuary. You say, how do we know that? For several reasons. The first reason is because of a command that says, fear God. Now, I have an entire presentation on what it means to fear God. But generally in the Bible, fear God is linked with keeping his commandments. And where are the commandments? In the sanctuary. Inside the Ark of the Covenant, in the most holy place. Notice, for example, Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13, and also verse 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, and what? Keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man, or this is man's all. And then notice, for God will bring every work into what? Is that word judgment in Revelation 14? It sure is. So it says, fear God, keep his commandments, for this is man's all, for God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Another evidence that this comes from the most holy place is the fact that the first angel's message tells us that we are to worship the Creator. What is the sign that God has given that He is the Creator? It is the Sabbath. Where is the Sabbath contained in the sanctuary? It is in the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place. So this is another reason why we know that the three angels' messages come from the most holy place. Another evidence is that the first angel's message says the hour of his judgment has come. What was the great day of judgment for Israel in the Old Testament? It was Yom Kippur. It was the day of atonement. Which apartment of the sanctuary was central to the day of atonement? It was the most holy place. So if the first angel's message says the hour of his judgment has come, it's pointing us to where? It's pointing us to the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Incidentally, in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 19, Revelation chapter 11 and verse 19, this is the introduction to Revelation 12, 13, and 14. We're told what happens in 1844. It says there, in Revelation 11, 19, then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple, 
and there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. So the temple of God is open in heaven because the judgment is going to begin. And in Revelation 14, we find the announcement of the judgment that begins in the most holy place of the sanctuary. And by the way, Revelation chapter 11 verse 19 says the temple of God is open in heaven. The judgment is about to begin. Probation hasn't closed. But after Revelation chapter 12, 13, and 14, when you get to chapter 15, the temple is opened again. By the way, when it says the temple, in Revelation it's used 16 times, the word naos. It always refers to the most holy place. In Revelation, the temple is not all of the temple structure. It is the most holy place when Revelation uses the word temple. And in Revelation chapter 15, we're told that the temple is opened again. But now the temple is not open for people to go into the temple by faith, to follow Jesus and his work in the most holy place. Now the temple is open, the most holy place is opened for the seven plague angels to come out and pour out God's wrath upon the earth. In other words, Revelation 11:19 begins the judgment by opening the most holy place Revelation chapter 15 opens it again, but now probation has closed. And right in the middle of those references you have, the hour of his judgment has come. Are you following me or not? Now let go, let's go to amazing fact number 10. The acceptance or rejection of these messages is not a trivial matter. Receiving them or rejecting them is a matter of life and death. To reject them is to reject eternal life. Those who receive the messages will receive the seal of God and be saved. Those who reject the messages will receive the mark of the beast and will be lost. There is no middle ground. And so as we proclaim these messages, we need to make sure that people are aware that these messages are not simply optional. Well, they're nice and we should do it. No, it's a matter of life and death, whether these messages are accepted or not. Now let's go to amazing fact number 11. God will have a faithful remnant who receive, obey, and proclaim the three angels' message. You say, how do we know that? Because at the very end of the third angel's message, we find the following words. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. God will have a remnant. And by the way, if you look at the last few verses of Revelation chapter 13, actually verses 11 to 18, it talks about the beast and his image and about receiving the mark. You know, when you get to verse 18, people have not been able to buy or sell. A death decree has been given against them. And so when you get to the last verse of chapter 13, you say, now wait a minute, was anybody faithful to God in the midst of this trial? Was there anyone who did not receive the mark of the beast that did not worship the image? If you read just Revelation 13, it doesn't tell you. But if you read the next five verses, it's a description of 144,000. And you have a character description of the 144,000. Actually, Revelation 14, 1 through 5 should be part of chapter 13 because it gives you the perspective of the remnant who are faithful. Notice Revelation chapter 15, verses 2 through 4. Revelation 15, 2 through 4. Here it describes the victorious group. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who have the, what? Ah, the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name standing on the sea of glass having harps of God. Is God going to have a people who are victorious over the beast, his image and his mark? Yes, he is. I pray to God that all of us who are gathered here will be in that group. You know, that'll be a wonderful time. We'll actually be able to sing. 
and we won't have to wear a mask. <laughs> and we won't have to social distance. Is that a good thing? Oh, I'll tell you, I'm looking forward to that day. You know, don't, uh, don't let anything in this world absorb your attention. People say, oh, I've got such a nice house, it's going to burn. <laughs> oh, I've got a, I've got a brand, I'm not going to tell you the model because some of you might have it. But, oh, I have this wonderful, luxurious car. Does it fly? Nothing we have on this earth compares to what we're going to have in eternity, folks. So why are we so attached to our stuff? If we're faithful, we're going to lose the stuff. We're going to have to proclaim this message in the midst of tremendous opposition. If we're not doing it now in times of relative peace and prosperity, what's it going to be like when we have to do it, when we can't buy or sell, and we've already seen that that can happen? And when our life is on the line, we have to have a passion to implement these 12 amazing facts that we're talking about. Let's go to fact number 12. The final controversy is all about worship and obedience to God, to His commandments. Let's read again Revelation 14 verses 6 and 7. And then let's read the third angel's message so that you can see the contrast. It says in Revelation 14, verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, which means to reflect His character. For the hour of His judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. So the first angel's message says, worship the Creator. Does the third angel's message speak about worship as well? Does it? It's the contrast. It says in Revelation chapter uh, 14, and beginning with verse 9, then a third angel followed them, saying, with a loud voice, If anyone worships, see the contrast? Worship the Creator. Here it's also worship, but it's worshiping the beast. If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And now notice how it ends. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. So what is the final issue about? Worship. If it involves worship, does it involve the Ten Commandments? Of course it does. Which one specifically? The fourth. Don't miss the 6.30 meeting today. The title is Sighing and Crying in Jerusalem. What day does the first angel's message tell us to keep? The Sabbath. Because God established the Sabbath as a memorial at creation. What day does the beast say that we're supposed to keep? The first day of the week, Sunday. See the contrast? And the issue is, is much larger than days. You see, when we keep the Sabbath, we are obeying the authority of the one who made the Sabbath. And when we keep the first day of the week, we are accepting the authority of the one who changed the Sabbath. Behind the days is the issue of which authority will we obey? And some people say, well, Pastor Bohr, um, you actually believe God is going to test the whole world over days? You hear lots of people who belong to other churches say that. God is going to test man over days? And my answer is always, well, God tested an Adam and Eve with a tree. Are 
are you following me? What was the purpose of testing Adam and Eve with the tree? The issue was, Eve, are you going to obey my authority or the serpent's authority? That's the issue. It's very simple. Now let's go to Revelation 18, 1 through 5, in the few moments that we have left. Revelation 18, 1 through 5. This is the three angels' message on steroids with booster cables. Are we longing for this day? Folks, we need to prepare. We need to get serious with the Lord. We need to be people of prayer. We need to get into the Word. And we need to get up off of our seat and we need to proclaim God's message. The three things that James Rafferty mentioned last night. The, the holy place experience. Witnessing, study of the Word, and prayer. Revelation 18, 1 through 5 says, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven. Having, these are details that are not in the first angel's message. Having great authority. And the earth was illuminated with his glory. And in case you didn't understand the great authority part, and the whole world being enlightened with his glory, it says in verse 2, And he cried mightily and if you didn't understand cried mightily with a loud voice that's why it's called the loud cry folks with a loud voice saying Babylon the greatest fallen has fallen and has become a, now Babylon is a lot worse Ellen White says that when this message is proclaimed the churches have uh, degenerated greatly since this message was first pre preached leading up to 1844 this is, this is a terrible the description. Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, and has become the dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. Those are three synonymous expressions. In other words, it's the same thing to say, dwelling place of demons, prison for every foul spirit, cage for every unclean and hated bird. Three, three synonymous phrases. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. Do you see the, the union here? The harlot with the kings of the earth. And the harlot rules over the multitudes. The merchants of the earth are on board. We're seeing that, aren't we? And then we find in verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying come out of her my people does God have people in Babylon most of God's people are still in Babylon so how are they going to know that they're supposed to come out an angel from heaven is going to come and whisper in their ear no an angel is going to help us proclaim this message and I heard another voice from heaven saying come out of her my people why must they come out? Lest you share in her what? And her sins. In her sins. And lest you receive of her plagues. So were the twelve amazing facts clear? Do we have a task to perform, folks? We do. So let's pray to the Lord that the Lord will help us empower us to proclaim these marvelous messages the reason for our existence let's pray father in heaven we thank you for giving us the privilege and the opportunity to share the final message with the world father we've hid it under a bushel help us lord to bring it out to the light of day because as we look at the world we see things winding down very quickly the final movements are indeed rapid ones Wake up us up from our slumber and help us to proclaim these messages with power. We pray in the precious name that is above all name, the name of Jesus. Amen.